Church of God or Christians? Um, I was challenged on this a while back, and somebody said, you know, should we really be calling ourselves Christians? Because in the Bible, if you look it up, they aren't really calling themselves Christians. It's more what the world calls them, and um, except for one reference that Peter makes, but which we'll look at here. Um, but, you know, I was challenged on this whole issue, and they said, um, you know, I read some things, people sent me articles and whatnot, and they said, you know, it's the, the real term is Church of God. Okay, and churches of God. All right, um, should we be changing that? Should we be saying we are the church of God? And I realize not the denomination church of God or church of Christ. <laughs> no, uh, I'm talking about what the Bible says here. Let's look up these different references here. Um, we'll get into it here. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, very familiar verse. And uh, if you know anything about the Bible, Acts chapter 11, some of the non-dispensational dummies out there, they'll say that, you know, they were Christians in the Old Testament, Christians in the Old Testament, Christians in the New Testament. Uh, well, that's a problem because they weren't even called Christians until Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It says here, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called. They didn't call themselves Christians. Okay, now I'm not going to say it's a sin to, to call yourself a Christian. All right, we're going to see that here in just a little bit. But it's more of what the world calls you. Okay, and again, this doesn't have to be some kind of a thing where now we all come out and we change our YouTube things to Church of God or, you know, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to go over this issue. Again, a lot of people will say, hey, brother, what about this? What about that? You know, they'll send me the scriptures for it or whatever. And, and I don't answer right away. And they, oh, you know, he's not willing to answer. Well, you know, I have to do the study first. I can't just, I'm not some kind of a pope that doesn't even need the Bible or whatever else. No, I have to do the study. I have to say, well, let me look at this. Let me pray about this. Let me, give me some time to answer this thing. There are some things I have studied and I can't answer quickly. Other things, give me a little bit of time here. I want to make sure I'm not falling for something that's false. Okay, Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Paul's on trial here. Um, verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Was Agrippa a saved man? No, he wasn't. What was he calling Paul? He called Paul a Christian. Okay? What does Paul say back? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. Paul didn't say, well, praise the Lord. I hope that you become a Christian. That's wonderful. You know, you should become a Christian. He said, you should be as I am, except these bonds. In other words, you should get saved, but, you know, you don't have to be bound up to like this. You know, that's what he was saying. So is the title Christian there, is that something that, you know, Paul was saying of himself? No, it was King Agrippa, a lost man, saying, you're almost persuading to be, me to be a Christian. All right. But now I'm going to show you the one reference to where a saved man says the word Christian. 1 Peter chapter 4. Did I get that right? 1 Peter, yes, chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. It says here, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you 
But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Stop there for a minute. What is the context? Peter is talking about you suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. People, you know, attacking you, basically. Keep that in mind. Verse 14. If ye, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, wind's blowing my pages here, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, um, but on your part he is glorified. Okay, I must have written down the wrong... Um, Okay, yeah, keep going. Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian. Hmm. Um, what did it say in verse 14? If ye, be, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ. If any of you suffer as a Christian. Hmm. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Okay, um, is the term Christian, you know, in context, then it, it would actually be sort of a derogatory thing that lost people were saying about you. You know, oh, you're a Christian. So how is it that we've taken the title Christian then? Hmm. Um, and again, you know, okay, I've, I've said I'm a Bible believing Christian over the years. Uh, there is reproach that comes on you if you believe the King James Bible, certainly. But it's something to think about here. Should we really be calling ourselves Christians when nobody in the Bible did? Peter says, if you're suffering as a Christian, if you're being reproached for the name of Christ, in other words, you're suffering as a Christian. People are making fun of you, saying you are a Christian. Agrippa says, you're almost persuading me to be a Christian. Well, why didn't he become one? Because he didn't want that shame. He's a king, you see. The disciples are called Christians first in Antioch. In, in Antioch. Antichrist, yeah. <sighs> um, but you see, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, oh, you're, you're one of those Jesus people, those, those followers of Jesus. Oh, you mean a Christian? Mm -hmm. So it's really a, 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 a title of reproach from the lost world. But I'm going to show you now the, uh, the term church of God and that that's actually what they called themselves. Um, lost people call us Christians. Say people call us the church of God. Let me show you that. A very interesting thing coming up here. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Turn to the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, hmm. which he hath purchased with his own blood. There's the first reference to it, the church of God there. Those words, church of God. Very interesting. Next, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one and beginning verse one. It's always more challenging out here when the wind's blowing. First Corinthians chapter one. I guess I should have a million dollar church building, then it wouldn't happen. You know. Yeah. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm, yeah. Calling upon the Lord to be saved and then call upon him, you know, calling upon him after that. We won't get into that whole thing, the false prophets out there with their false gospels, but you know what I'm saying if you're aware of the movement here. But again, you see the church of God. Paul writing and saying to the church of God. He's not saying to Christians. Hey, I'm writing to Christians. He's writing to the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10.
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 through 33. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Okay? Um, what are the three groups there that Paul mentions in verse 32? Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. And you say, well, that's, then there must be three different groups within the body of Christ or something. No. There's, that's, heretics will come out with that kind of a thing, that there's some kind of a separate bride, separate church of God and whatever, and you have the Jews, Gentiles. See, the Jews were saved by the gospel of repentance to salvation. That's hyper-dispensationalism, okay? Also known as nutty nonsense. All right, it's talking about Jews and Gentiles that are lost and to the church of God. So Paul's saying, you know, give no offense there. Don't just be a needlessly offensive to lost Jews, lost Gentiles, or even to save brethren in the church of God. How do you know that? Verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, all men, not all saved men, okay? You're supposed to have a good report of them that are without, without the church, in other words. Not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Does the church of God need to be saved? No. Who is he talking about? The Jews and the Gentiles of verse 32. Okay? Important to understand that distinction there. But again, you see Paul referring to saved brethren as the church of God, not as Christians. You know, and, and it just, it, it, I think one of the things that ticks me off the most is the devil raising up false movements. Man, I hate that. Infiltrators in perils among false brethren. Paul writes about that. And you'll get these people that are just completely false and they just come in and they just mess stuff up, you know, and, you know, why did Satan have to raise up somebody? I know why, but, you know, why did Satan have to raise up somebody to come out with a false church of God? And then you have assemblies of God and the church of Christ and things like this. Just, uh, you know, you're stealing a title. And now the devil's raising up people to come out with the, they're calling themselves Bible believing, you know, I'm, as Bible believers, they're not, and they're not Bible believers, you know, like I said, James White has, I heard him recently say, as, as Bible-believing Christians, you know, he's not a Bible believer. <laughs> it's just the devil loves to raise up his ministers to, to mess up, you know, what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through verse 22. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Get a hold of that one. There will be heresies. Why? So God can prove who, is, who are those that are genuinely saved, the approved. Professions mean nothing, in other words. Okay, remember that. Oh, I'm a Christian. Really? Oh, I'm part of the church of God. Are you really? Hmm. Going to be a little bit of an approval there before we just uh, accept you in. Verse 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Corinthians had a few problems there. <laughs> Verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and a drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and he goes into the thing of what we would call communion, remembering the Lord's death. But you see, what he's saying there is, he's not talking about coming together to eat the Lord's Supper, drinking wine and having some unleavened bread. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about these people meeting together, and here's some guy who doesn't have much money, barely can put food on the table and some other rich, you know, person there. And they have all kinds of, you know, bring in a steak sandwich or something like that. And the, and the guy over here is kind of looking and thinking, wow, you know, I thought we were here to worship the Lord. You know, that's why I've always had a problem with, you know, church fellowships or whatever else where they have a lot of food and they're, they're doing this whole food thing. Everybody's 
you know, I've seen churches where they'll, they'll be sitting there drinking coffee and eating a donut during the service. And you think, what is this? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just crazy. So let's look at the next one. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15 and verse nine. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, when did Paul persecute the church of God? When he was lost. Um, why didn't he call them Christians? Looking back. Because he's saved now. So his terminology changes. He doesn't say, I persecuted those Christians. That's a derogatory term, actually, if you want to get right down to it. In the New Testament times, somebody comes up and says, hey, you're a Christian. That was an insult. Okay? Paul is now saved and he changes his speech and he says, I persecuted the church of God. At the time, you, you know, go back when he's Saul and he's persecuting people, you say, who are you persecuting? He probably said, oh, it's Christians. You know, stinking Christians. He, heretical cult, the sect. You know? He gets saved. What did you do in the past there? I persecuted the church of God. His speech changed. Maybe our, our uh, speech should change too. Just something to think about. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to go through all the references, by the way, to church of God. There aren't that many. Just so you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. If you're part of the church of God, by the way, you are a saint. I am a saint. Okay? I don't have to be uh, canonized by the Catholic Church. <laughs> okay? You don't have to shoot a cannon at me or shoot me out of a cannon. You know, that's not what canonized means. I'm just a little joke there. A little joke. You know, get it? <laughs> Um, but uh, you don't have to go through the canonization process of a real miracle. And I forget all the other stuff. I, I did a video on the, you know, what are saints thing. And I, I went over the actual qualifications that the Catholic Church says you have to have. Uh, no, just membership in the Church of God. That's all it is. Membership in the Church of God and you're a saint. Pretty simple. Galatians chapter 1. Turn in your King James Bible to the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. Again, he's persecuting them as a lost man, but now that he's a saved man, he doesn't call them Christians. He doesn't call his brethren Christians. He says the church of God. Persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Okay, um, and, and by the way, I'd like to just point out the fact that when he's persecuting the church of God and wasted it, it doesn't mean he wrecked a building. Okay, Paul didn't come in with a big bulldozer, or, you know, big D8 caterpillar or something, and smash some building down or something or whatever the equivalent would have been back then. Uh, some big catapult or, you know, that's not what he means when he said he wasted the church of God. The church of God is living people, which we'll see here in a little bit. Very interesting tie-in there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. And, you know, there's other references in the Bible to churches of God, which we're not going to get into. But it's just, when you have churches of God, that's not, you know, local churches or something like this. A New Testament local church. There's no such thing as a local church in the New Testament. Okay? Churches of God simply means groups of believers meeting together. That's all it means. All right. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Um, a man's supposed to have his children in subjection. They're supposed to be good children. Like I got the one down here. There's his hat. <laughs> Out riding his bike today. Likes to be near dad when, when I'm preaching. Um, but that's a responsibility. Uh, and that doesn't mean just, you know, 
making his life miserable by always punishing him and whatever else. I have to be an example to my son. And if, if you're a, an elder, a bishop, uh, you have to, to rule well your own house. Because if you don't, how are you going to take care of the church of God? It's a real good challenge there. But to jump down in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 there to verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is, you say, the house of God. Oh, the house of God. That's our Baptist church, our temple. Oh, oh, the house of God. That's what our pastor says. It's good to be in the house of God. <laughs> uh, no, keep reading. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Hmm. Um, did you know that that's another reference to the resurrection of the body of Christ? Look at it. Verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. You know what happens at the resurrection? We're going to be coming unto the Lord. And uh, we're going to be coming unto Paul as well. Talk about coming unto thee shortly. Come up hither. The dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. You know, uh, meet the Lord in the clouds. I can't think of the verse right now. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm trying to make a point here. The point is, we get caught up to be with the Lord. And we come to Him shortly, in other words. Kind of an interesting thing. And I find it interesting that the last time that the church of God appears, it's now the church of the living God. Very interesting. Of course, we know the Lord's living. We understand that. But uh, I just find it kind of interesting that there's a lot of saints right now which are dead um, and waiting for the resurrection. And uh, when the resurrection happens, we're all going to be living with God. We will be the church of the living God at that point in time. Very interesting that the very last time that the church of the living God appears, or the church of God appears in your King James Bible, um, it's before the book of Revelation. Hmm. And it's at the end of the Pauline epistles, essentially. Not the very last book of the Pauline epistles. It's not in Philemon, but it's one of the last books there that he's writing. Hmm. Interesting. Um, if the church needed to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, or the Great Tribulation, if you want to call it that, uh, wouldn't there be the church of God in that time period? You say, what's it called? What's, what's, is there any kind of reference to the church in that time? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Let me show you. Hebrews chapter 12. We don't have the exclusive rights to the word church. Okay, we, you know, the dispensationalists will say the church age. I understand why I'm a dispensationalist myself, but it's not really correct to call it the church age. Because the church is there, there are churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, church just means called out assembly. It's not some magic word that, that you know, whatever. The church of God, on the other hand, is a different situation. Okay, get the distinction there. You should, you know, dispensationalists should rightly say the church of the living God, you know, dispensation or the church of the living God age or whatever else. Church of God age, church of God time. Uh, it's not really correct to say the church. Uh, there's references to the church being in the Old Testament because it's a called out assembly. And there are references to the church being there in the time of Jacob's trouble. Doesn't mean the church of God. There's a distinction. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Hmm. General assembly and church of the firstborn there which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. This is speaking to Jewish, saved Jews in the future. I firmly believe that. See that ye refuse not him that, is, that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Huh, some very interesting things there whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. 
And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed, cannot be moved, excuse me, um, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Um, can't get into all that stuff there. I mean, I could preach a sermon just on Hebrews chapter 12. They're uh, really amazing stuff. You see the, the thing of the time of Jacob's trouble. You see that, you know, they're not the ones that are hearing the voice of the Lord calling them and saying, come up hither. Um, they go into that time. There's the new covenant there. The new covenant is not for Christians. It's for the nation of Israel. The new covenant and the new Testament are not the same thing. All right. If anybody preaches that they're false prophet, just mark it right down. Okay. People don't understand what the new covenant is. I did, did it again. I have a whole study on that. The thing of the new covenant. When does the new covenant come in? The new versions a lot of times will change new Testament to new covenant because they're false Vatican versions. The Vatican believes in replacement theology, a form of replacement theology. Um, but really, really rich chapter there, Hebrews chapter 12, on the issue of God dealing with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Um, it's not about, you know, the church of God. I almost said Christians. But, you know, now that we're at the end of the, this, this study here, um, you know, again, if, if you're saying the word Christian, Okay, you know, that's what the world's going to call you. That's what the world's going to say about you. But the real term is church of God. Okay. Um, and like I said, the biggest one there that really convinces me to change some of my language, you know, a word from my speech is the Apostle Paul. He's talking about when he's persecuting the body of Christ and he doesn't say I was persecuting Christians back then. He says I was per persecuting the church of God. In so many words, that's what he said. He's not saying, hey, we're Christians, that's why, you know, no. Uh, if any man suffer as a Christian, you're being reproached for the name of Christ. You see how it lines up? So, um, do what you want, but I think that, you know, uh, as we strive to conform ourselves more and more to this book and less and less to the world, I think that we should change our speech and, and stop saying, uh, well, as a Christian, I believe such and such. Well, somebody comes up to you, oh, I'm a Christian. You say, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> you know, are you are you part of the church of God? Then again, they're going to say, well, I don't care that, not that denomination. <sighs> Let me explain. <laughs> you know, maybe just say the church of the living God, I think might be good. I'm a born again member of the church of the living God. That's what they were saying in the Bible. Um, you know, the new birth is there for a Christian. This is going to be tough. <laughs> the new birth is there for a, a believer. Okay, we are born again, certainly. Um, your life changes drastically when you get saved. Praise the Lord for that change. But, uh, you know, we're part of the church of God. Okay, now you will suffer as a Christian. People make fun of you as a Christian. Okay, but I really think that we should call ourselves what the Bible says, church of God, church of the living God. So uh, to those people out there that, that challenged me on that and said you really shouldn't be saying Christian, it should be more the church of God, you were right. And I'm going to try to kind of change some of that speech of mine. And um, I'm not too proud to admit when I'm wrong. Simple. It just I don't come right out with things right away because I need to do the study. I need to look into things. But uh, I thank the Lord for His Word. And I just pray you've been challenged by this study and that your speech will conform to God's perfect standard, his word. So that is going to be it. Uh, we'll see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, 
Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.